So we are at the Godokan, uh, like right now maybe 20, 25 of us, more 20. Tw we were 25 plus yesterday. Wow. And, uh, more than wearing Godot t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> I want one of those. Yeah. I don't know if it yeah, will be cost efficient to yeah. send them over to Argentina, but I'll definitely send yeah, you. You guys in France. I guess I could send Ariel the design, and he could maybe get some printed. Okay. Oh yeah. Next time, one of when you come to Europe, we can try to get you okay. some. Okay. Yeah, I will be there. I will be there around like April or May, so we can arrange something. Yeah, definitely. So, so far we had quite a night, nice time. Yesterday we had, we just had like a hackathon. We worked on projects together and Fabio Fales made a nice presentation about networking and we recorded it. So we'll put it online um, soon. And uh, we are recording you right now too. So uh, be careful, you're going to be on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we thought could be nice to see you and maybe I don't know what you can just talk about what you want. Uh, an idea I had was you could maybe if you can set up some screen sharing, um, lead us quickly through the source code. Uh, how is it set up? Yeah, so the idea I had was maybe some of us are already doing some development. Others are mostly developing games, but might be interesting in having an overview on how the how Godot is built, how you chose to organize the code repository and just like present what is core, what is what are the servers, um, so that people know where to look when they want to change something in the UI or. Well, look, I, I'm not sure. Well, what would you like to see, or or or? I, I don't know. Give an overview about uh, how the code is organized. So, what is in core? What are the drivers? What is so okay? So really well organized, but many people maybe never dug into the source code. So, just give a basic overview so that when people want to actually w try to see why does it work like that in the editor, I would like to change it. They know that they have to look in tools, editor, plugins, and then uh, find the right plugin to edit. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, one, one thing that is important is that, uh, can you see the mouse pointer here? Yes, we see it. Oh, okay, cool. Oh. Uh, all the folders here uh, have some kind of hierarchy. I mean, one depends on the other. Uh, it's not like, uh, that's very rarely a, a mutual dependency. So if we were going to do it like uh, in order, I think, uh, well, the new third party folder is probably the, the first because it does not depend on anything else. This is just the libraries uh, that we use that Remy has organized here very nicely. Uh, so this is everything that Godot uses uh, uh, for working, uh, third party libraries, usually with a compatible license to Godot, which is the MIT. Uh, we we can't use like GPL libraries because uh, it, it's uh, it would force the entire engine to have the G G GPL uh, license. So uh, the first uh, the first folder that you should probably look at is core, which has all the core types uh, of code. Uh, you can see like uh, everything that is core to, to the engine, just really low level is here. You can see like all the memory allocations, the base resource class. Uh, and probably the, the first class that I would take a look at, if you just want to understand how it works, is the, the object class, which is here. I'm trying to get used to the to Apple. Not easy. Uh, where is that class? Yeah, there. Uh, this is like the, the main class, which is the object type. This is like all the all the nodes and resources inherited from from this. Uh, if you look at it in low level, uh, there's like uh, three things that the object class will do. Uh, it has this like hideous and horrible macro, which is like GD class. It used to be object type, but then it's not GD class. It's, it's used to so you can create your 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 own uh, classes. But I think the most important functions are the, the set function, the get function, and get, get property function. Uh, this is what is used for like getting properties out of objects. 
in general, the property is like uh, passed like as this variant type. Uh, and this type is more like uh, it, ca it can contain all the data types that are useful to the engine. Uh, so the objects are like uh, instances. You, you can create a class an object and use instance it. And you can like pass properties and get properties and get the proper list. Uh, and then you can check like the variant class. These are the two main classes, I think. Uh, and here you, you have like, a, it's like an um, object that can hold the most uh, common types in the engine. Like you, you have here like a, a null value, a boolean, integer, real string, vector, uh, all the math stuff. Uh, the color image, uh, this is the main type. And these are like, they have been renamed here like pool arrays uh, because of the way code manages memory. These are special arrays that are in a memory that you can compact and rearrange. Uh, so you don't have to fear uh, fragmentation on the, on the memory. Uh, all the big allocations are done with these arrays. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. And variant has a, you can use it like a dynamic uh, type in C++, which is pretty cool. You can assign any of the types and assign to any of the types. And that, that was pretty nice. Uh, so this is like the core. Uh, I, I would advise that if you're starting to work with Godot, just get familiar with the classes here. Uh, you have a, a bit more subcategories like the math classes here, uh, the input output classes here, uh, and then uh, a few helpers. I don't know what it is, uh, the, and this is like a binder for the for them to script, uh, and pretty much just that. So if you are used now and you understand the core classes or have an idea of what is in there, the next is the servers, and the servers is kind of like a concept. Uh, you here you can use them uh, to to set data to to, to talk to the hardware. Uh, the main one is the visual server, which handles all the graphics. You can see a lot of functions like managing textures, uh, shaders, and materials, and uh, the arrays and the meshes, uh, and then the, I mean, many things that are just for drawing. It, it's, it, I think it's the biggest class in the engine. It has everything like related to, related to drawing, but it's all low level. Not, not really uh, objects or anything like that, just functions with a resource ID, because all this is stored internally. Uh, you have a server for a physics, which is similar. It's just for physics. You have like, the shapes, the bodies, uh, the space, the, the areas. And this, this one is new, which is the audio server. This one does not use resource IDs anymore. It just contains buses and, in, and calls the, the mixing code for mixing audio. So one, once you understand the, the servers, the next one is the, um, the scene. And this is like everything that you see in the editor. Uh, and the editor in code is just uh, nodes. Uh, the base class here is in main and it's node. And everything in the scene inherits from this. This is the, the node class. Uh, this has like all the basic functions for arranging nodes in hierarchy. I think unlike other engines, uh, what node has is it does not have any like meaningful information. It only has information about being like in the tree, but doesn't really have any position in space or anything. For that, you have to use the classes that inherit that, which are the 3D classes, the 2D classes, animation classes, audio classes. And all these are nodes that you can inherit. And then you have resources that are resources for that the nodes use. Uh, and then finally, after the scene, what you have is the, uh, the drivers, uh, and in the drivers you have uh, everything that is uh, related mostly to operating system, not so much third party. Like for example, this is an audio driver for Alsa, which is a sound system for Linux. Uh, you have uh, the OpenGL drivers. Uh, this one, I don't remember why. Ah, yeah, and some library, the, the interfaces to using the libraries in third party are also, in, uh, some of them are in drivers. Uh, I don't remember why actually. I think because they, these are core ones. The PNG one is using within the engine, so it's a core library. Everything else is like in modules. You have Unix drivers, Windows drivers, uh, and, and others. Then you have the modules, which are like uh, the, this. This you can remove. Uh, the ones in drivers you just can't remove from the engine because they are used from in the engine. But the, the modules you can turn off uh, and not use anymore. And here you have the interfaces to the libraries in third party. 
uh, and probably uh, this is like a grid map, etc. A, a model. The scripting is a is a model. The networking is a model. You can just remove them. You can compile without them to make the binary smaller. Or in case the, the platform or operating system does not uh, support this. So and then finally, there is the main folder, which is this one. This just has the main class, which is used for the. This is the entry point of the engine. Uh, the, these functions here are called by all implementations, which is like set up the engine, start the engine, iterate like a frame passes. Uh, this is outside because some platforms like Android uh, ask you to process the the frame in a callback. So this has to be a separate function. It cannot be. You can't have like a main loop in some platforms, but you know a while when and check the events and everything. Some platforms do not allow for this, so this is designed like to be portal to have like a start iteration cleanup and force withdraw. I don't remember what that was for, but and then finally you have the tools. This has mostly the the editor, and the editor has all the all the editor interface is made like within Golot. It's as big as the rest of the engine, and this is all the code for the editor, which is in tools and editor. And I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I don't think there's anything missing. Uh, there's this platform thing. Uh, well, platform is the, the operating system driver. Instead of a driver, you have the whole platform. Uh, and this is every platform that Godot supports. Uh, in generally, when you have the classics that are unique to the platform, they are just put in here. Like, for example, uh, on Android, you have like the native audio driver, uh, directory access, file access, uh, and anything like that. Those are the, the native uh, um, versions of the, the portable classes in the engine. And that's pretty much it. I think it's quite well organized. It's much better now that we have a third party directory uh, because now we, we could separate the, the, the drivers and the models and everything much better. So I, I think that's about it. Uh, um, that's all I can think about it. If you have any question or anything, feel free to ask. Maybe you can uh, show how the editor is organized in like plugins, input output plugins, um, and maybe relate yeah. to uh, what they refer to when you are actually using the editor. So if someone wants to change uh, the editor used to handle uh, spatial objects, so the 3D plugin could show how it yeah. is, where it is, how it is basically set up, much like a GDScript class, but in C++. All right. Well, the editor is kind of a mess. Uh, it has so many classes. Uh, its user interface code usually is ugly. Uh, it's difficult to make it like clean and nice. Uh, that that I think it's at this point of my life, I think it's impossible to make clean user interface code. Mm -hmm. So the editor is, is kind of messy. It, it has a lot a lot of files, as you can see. Uh, the main one is the editor node. Uh, this one. This is pretty much, this con This class is a node that contains all the editor. So you can kind of check in here, like all the actions you can do from the menus and all the sub nodes and things that it uses. Uh, just by looking at the, the, the properties of the editor node, you can kind of guess what everything is. Uh, it has a lot of functions, it's super, super big. I always try to like move functionality out of it, but it, functionality keeps piling up also on it. So it's, it's really big. And uh, the, the names of the, the, the files should kind of tell you what they are uh, in most cases, I think. Uh, some of them are like, uh, let me check. Uh, mo most of the editors for notes and stuff are like in, in the plugins folder. You can see like all the editors in, in Godot, the editors are contextual. So they appear when you edit the kind of resource or node and disappear when you're not editing it. So you can see all the edit speci specific editors here. And the main ones, I think, are the canvas item uh, editor, which is the 2D editor. It's just a single file. It's somewhere around here and here. It's a single file. It's pretty big, but it's just what it, the 2D editing is this plugin. Uh, the 3D editing editor is a special, uh, where is it? Here, the special editor is a 3D editor. It's also a, a big class. These are probably the big editor classes. The other ones are really small. Uh, everything else is uh, smaller. Probably the tile map editor is uh, a bigger. Uh, 
this one this one is deprecated it's going to be remote this this is the input and output plugins but this is going to be remote in the next version uh, it's going to be replaced by this one which is the new import plugins uh, they are much simpler like if you, if you want to have some comparison like for example uh, the, the code for importing a texture to the engine before was like super big like uh, texture I think it's commented right now yeah uh, it, it was really big, it's, yeah, let me check, right? 2,000 lines of code. Uh, now the new import system is much simpler, so I think it's a lot less code. Uh, let me check it. Yeah, 400 lines of code is much, a lot less code. Yeah. Also, the interface for doing the editors are, are much simpler. Uh, then, let me check. I think some classes that are meaningful to, to look at. Uh, most are like, I think, obvious, but the, this one editor file system uh, has the, the cage of all the files in the project and the types and the dependencies and everything. Uh, this makes like exporting fast. Uh, also, it, it is what shows this class is accessible for everything like file dialogs or the file system doc uh, just for getting files. And it, in the new version of Godot, it also has the functionality of checking uh, when a file changes and it's to be reimported. So the, it has this new functionality. Uh, and then, I don't know, it's, uh, let, let me check if there is anything like meaning. Well, this is the other plugin, the C version. The script version inherits from this one to make plugins. It's kind of big and full of functions, but I think it's easier to do this way than having a lot of classes. We just hard code what our users need and put it in there in an accessible way instead of exposing the classes which may change over time. Uh, so this, this keeps it a bit more compatible with our versions. Uh, and then I don't know, the inspector no, property editor is used a lot in the engine. This is the typical, when you see this, this uh, two columns property editing everywhere in Godot, it's just this class property editor. It's super hard. I think probably the, the most hacky class in the engine. Mm. Uh, and then and there's not a lot more. It's just dialogues and stuff that appear all around. Um, there's a class for gizmos. You can create gizmos for for different objects that you make yourself. Uh, but you have all this accessible from the editor plugin class. So it's more accessible now, I think. Uh, and that's pretty much it. There's not a lot more. If you look at the name classes in general, it kind of, uh, they, they are self-descriptive. Like, there are a lot of classes that need to be removed from what I'm seeing that are just being obsoleted in the new version. But uh, I don't know. I just like auto load settings is, you probably guess that when you edit auto loads in the editor, this is the, the window. Uh, so I don't know, the fonts just, this is hard coded like inside the binary. All the fonts that the editor uses and the code that it initializes. Uh, this is the, the help. When you see help, uh, this is the editor help. In general, it's all the, the name is the the part of the editor that you see. So I, I hope that's not too complicated. Uh, actually, after seeing this, uh, if you agree, maybe uh, probably we should rename tools to editor because it's pretty much the editor. You know, uh, that was the trick on my side. I knew that you don't look at the source code in depth from the perspective of a new user. And I thought maybe if we have one, have a real look in depth to explain the stuff, you will see stuff that needs to be changed. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's probably something to consider, like moving editor to the outside and removing tools and just put these ones inside the editor because the editor still uses all these. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think that, that will make the code probably cleaner. Uh, we have a nice, <laughs> more, more things to do in the to-do. We'll never have Godot 3 at this point, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's as much as I can think of uh, in the source code. Um, I don't know. I would like to show some of the st stuff I'm working on, but I don't have it on this computer. I don't even know if it runs on this computer. Let me check. But that's as much for the editor. Uh, I don't know if you have any question or is there, I can tell you about the work being done in the new uh, render or anything if you want, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's too bad I cannot show anything. Uh, maybe I can use the Twitter which has the screenshots. Uh, let me check. Ah, well. 
Yeah, so uh, I'm Flores. Can you see me? Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, first of all, thanks for the awesome work you are doing. Um, and uh, I, I have a question. It's uh, not on the source code, but more on the new import system. So I've seen, I've tried the new branch, and I've seen that uh, if the resources are, well, the imported resources are, uh, let's say, out of sync, it automatically reimports them. Uh, and yeah. My question is, would it be possible to add a confirmation for that? Because I remember the pain when working with uh, Unity 3D. Uh, I had uh, some. Uh, I worked for a company that they were using Unity 3D, and sometimes you were just working with it on different branches, and you switched to the wrong branches, and they started reimporting everything, and you had maybe to wait like 20 minutes or 10 minutes for the report to finish. Uh, and then, uh, but then you say, oh no, it wasn't that branch, it was the other one, but you still have to wait for the import to finish and it deleted the previous import. So, would that, would that be possible? Is, is that uh, like planned or no? I'm not sure. Uh, in the old version of Godot, the, the, the two, uh, Godot 2, it also has this, it also automatically reports when you change the branch. Uh, so if you are using importing, uh, this one is probably worse because all your images in, in the project are also imported. Uh, this was required for, for many reasons, like, uh, for example, uh, for using like textures for 3D, you, you want them in a format where you want to like put them in video memory, like uh, S3DC, texture compression and things like that. And for that, you had to like, before you had to put the file outside the project, and then import it to convert it to, to that format only so you can use it on geometry, which was kind of a hassle. Uh, I think it's kind of an unavoidable that it has to re-import because uh, it's probably better that it keeps a consistent state, that a broken state, because it, it, if a broken state is allowed at some point, uh, it's probably going to be worse because it's going to, users will probably find uh, bugs that are, that are not really bugs just because uh, uh, the inconsistent state yeah, this also was a reason why uh, we made the import automatic in the previous version of Godot, uh, because users will also find inconsistent states with the assets all the time. Uh, so in the end, we made it automatic because, uh, for example, uh, you may have missed to import a translation, uh, but you were sure that you uh, updated the file with uh, with uh, with lines of text. So. Uh, I usually work with the, with what was my company and also with others that use the engine. And usually, this problem of inconsistent state was very common. So that's why we changed the report. Uh, the new system just tries to make everything more consistent, even more consistent. But yeah, I don't I don't think it can be avoided that it will have to report the files if you change uh, because it will always try to keep the state consistent. Maybe um, for the use case that uh, Fabio described. It, maybe the editor could check if there are like more than 10 files, 10 files that need to be reimported. It could display a warning and say, uh, 250 files need to be, be reimported. Agree, cancel, or for, just for the use case when you're switching branches and you actually don't want to reimport because you messed up. And then maybe it could display somewhere in the editor to make sure you know you are updated and you need to reimport if you want to actually do work. It could also prevent playing the game until you re-import or... But maybe just not do it, if it's a lot of files, not do it out of the box, but just ask for confirmation. We, we could make it optional in worst case, like we, we can show uh, a button that says that you have to re-import. Uh, but we can make that like configurable from with the, the, the settings. But probably the, the best would be to make the default behavior to re-import. Just so it's always consistent, uh, and you, you avoid the... Because maybe the user thinks, which is what it used to happen before, when we didn't have automatic import in the previous version, mm -hmm. that the users would just ignore the red icon that says that you have dependencies that have changed, and they were, hey, why did this didn't change? Or, and the red icon was there, and nobody pushed it, uh, so it, that was a problem. Uh, when we, we made this manual, so I think it should be automatic. Uh, maybe we can configure it optionally if you want in your computer to make it optional, but it usually should be better if it's automatic by default. So I guess we'll just try it, and if it's, in, if it's a pain, then we'll add some options to simplify okay. it. Are there other questions? 
the guys are shy here. Or maybe they, don't, they are just eager to hear more about the stuff you're working on, so if you want to present some stuff. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, I, I can tell you about the work that is being done in the, in the new version of Podo, if you wish. Uh, it's probably going to be the biggest release since it was open source by far. Uh, there's a lot of code that was re rewritten from scratch in the core. Uh, we, we, I remember like for years we, were, we had this document where we, we were piling up everything that we, we would need to break compatibility to, to, to fix uh, like bugs or usability problems or things that we just couldn't uh, fix because it would break compatibility with projects. And now for the new version, uh, we are going to break compatibility anyway because the renderer is new and the way it's like physically based and it's not compatible anymore with the previous projects. So great chance to break everything. So <laughs> we took a little more time expected in, in doing all this. But it's pretty cool because now uh, a lot of things that were on the list were pretty much everything has been uh, done. Uh, which is great. You, you look at the source code now, for example, the memory functions now are much simpler. Uh, the, the, I think the file functions are simpler. A lot, a lot of things are much simpler in the editor. We just removed a lot of old code that was more complex, probably because of over design. Uh, we thought that the, the typical programmer error that uh, you make something flexible because you think you're going to use it in different ways, and then you just use it in a single way. And you realize that uh, your code is a lot more complex than it needs to be because uh, you don't need that uh, abstraction or things like that. So mostly it was moving uh, all that. Uh, there was a lot in the engine that was already signed, so we had uh, the chance to remove that. Uh, like uh, the audio, the audio system was super already signed. Now it's just like two classes, and it used to be a lot of them before. We, we had like special some servers and things like that. It's now all gone. Uh, just a single class is going to do this in a node. Uh, so it's pretty good that we could uh, redesign this. Uh, it's, it was probably one of the things like uh, avoiding us to have a better uh, functions and features. So having the chance to do it was great. Uh, it took like two or three weeks, but it was I think it was really worth it. Uh, and this combined with the new the new renderer is going to be great. It, the problem is that we just couldn't. Uh, well, I was against releasing a, a 2.2 because uh, of the compatibility breaking. We would introduce like Visual Scripting and networking and everything, and then uh, the projects like the Visual Scripts because they are saved in binary, they will probably not work in, if you just uh, migrate to. So uh, it was probably, I, I hope for, for the best that we didn't uh, release the, 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 that version. But the problem is that it's going to be like an, an year be, between uh, 2.1 and, and 3. I hope less. Uh, it, it's pretty much close to be completely in features now. Uh, but I, I hope it's going to be, to be worth it. I think the new render is pretty cool. Uh, it, it's impressive what, what could be done with the... the we're, we're using the, the GL uh, ES, the embedded one, instead of Vulkan, because of compatibility. But it's really cool that this, this allows to make all the advanced features that, that it has. Uh, we have like PBR, uh, global illumination, which works really good. Uh, we have uh, like a lot of things like reflection props and uh, new shadow mapping. It's all very modern. You, you take like a real engine and you compare it to the new world render and it's pretty much on the same level. Uh, in fact, the global illumination system in, in the new world is probably better than you can find right now in, in Unity or Unreal which is pretty cool, uh, but uh, I guess it has to be like, get, we have to get rid of all the bugs and all the problems because it's super unstable now. I think that's probably going to take more time than I, I thought it's going to take. Uh, but I, if everyone helps and tests it and makes stuff with it, it will be faster to get something going, I guess. Uh, it's, it's still me, it's still Farsh, still asking questions. So, uh, yeah. the other uh, day at Fosdem, a, a guy asked me if we had any plans on uh, supporting uh, EGL instead of GLX on, uh, on uh, Unix, on Linux, for, uh, for initializing, you know, XORG uh, OpenGL drivers. Uh, because he was saying that, like, Wayland doesn't really support GLX 
and then some some like ARM boards or some specific drivers only support EGL, which is apparently the new standard for initializing OpenGL. But I have really little experience on on OpenGL, so I'm basically asking you if there's any plan or basically what's your stance on this. Mm, I don't know. I haven't really taken a look at this. I think we use AG, AGL from Android, I think, but it's a Java version. Uh, I'm not very familiar with it. I think I use it at some point, but I, I don't remember. I'm not sure how much we can place. Uh, I think it's only for the initialization of the graphics. Uh, you yeah. still have to create the window and everything uh, yourself. Uh, I think like X11 is like what nightmares are made of. It's the worst API I have ever seen. It's really bad. <laughs> Uh, I remember, like, a few years ago, I was, uh, more like 10 years ago, I, I tried to make a toolkit uh, so I could, like, make for the engine and for for the music software I used to make. I was like, I'm going to make a, a UI toolkit that works with X11. Um, yeah, I had to abandon the project because of the complexity. It was really complex. Uh, I remember talking to Kate Parker, with, who is one of the, the main developers, and he told me that uh, they he was young and made a lot of mistakes, uh, and that everyone is using it now, and that it's a disaster. Uh, and yeah, it's like uh, if if we can get rid of, of X11, it would be fantastic. I don't think uh, uh, AGL. I don't think AGL replaces it completely just a like GLX. Uh, you still need to handle a lot of things like the input and the mouse and, and things that that need to be changed. And unfortunately, like. You have like two competing standards, which are like uh, the Wayland and the Mir and Ubuntu, and like a lot of people use Ubuntu, so it's a problem. Uh, supporting like both would probably be a lot of work, and supporting one would be unfair to the ones who don't use it. So for now, I think the best is to keep with to 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 X11, even if it really sucks. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I. If we have like enough you know, volunteers that want to work on both versions, that would be fine. We, we can have the, the ports and, and do away with X11, but I think for now it's probably better to wait. Uh, I'm betting that the, that Canonical is going to give up on Mir at some point uh, because it, it clearly is a, a lot of work for them to, to, to develop. It's taking them like years uh, to do it and to wait for hardware support and thing. I, I think the only reason they want that way is because it works with Android too, uh, but I'm not sure if that's going to, to to be a good reason in a few years. So I, I prefer to be patient and wait and see how it turns out uh, and see if like Wayland uh, becomes uh, the, the default or if it doesn't of the two of them of, or maybe the one of them emulates the other uh, per perfectly so we can just go for one of them. I don't really know. I think at this point it's probably better to be patient and, and wait to see what happens. So it still works fine right now. So. Uh, okay, so so actually that guy said he was uh, going to have a look into the code and uh, try to see if he could have an, op an EGL version which works on both X11 and, and uh, Wayland. So maybe we'll see him contributing, hopefully, uh, and then we'll see. <laughs> Thanks anyway. Uh, cool. But yeah, I think uh, walking to EGL is not that hard. I talked with the same guy and uh, I just checked in the platform code and it's basically just GL context X11, which uses GLX, so we could add the compiler define and re-implement the same stuff in EGL and then build uh, Godot with EGL, I think. So okay, if that works and it works in every platform, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the Raspberry Pi uses EGL, so that, yeah. that will help you, I guess. Mm. Uh, yes, there's a question from Rasmus. Yeah. Hello, my name is Erasmus, uh, also known as Keats. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, shifting track a little bit, I was wondering uh, how WebAssembly is going and uh, if it's in a kind of stable uh, state and uh, if you will see it in 3.0. WebAssembly uh, is like uh, super new. Uh, one, one of the guys, uh, uh, one of them has been made, trying to compile it. So far it seems to be working. Uh, he, from what I remember, he told us that uh, that it was loading really fast compared to to ASN.js. Uh, I think the I would probably next week I will be working on WebGL two, uh, which is uh, compatible with the new renderer. 
uh, with that, we should be able to have like a prototype of a lot running on WebAssembly and WebGL2, which is clearly the, the future. Uh, it will be really interesting to see how it works. Uh, I have a lot of faith on it. Uh, and uh, I think just the part of compiling to WebAssembly was pretty simple. Uh, I mean, compared to just uh, what was originally porting to the platform, because it's compatible with the ASM.js. Uh, we will see what works and what doesn't in the browser for WebGL2. Uh, and once we get it working, I think we will have a nice prototype for the work running on the web for next year. So that, that's what I, what I can tell, I guess. Uh, hi, I'm Laura. Hi. Um, and uh, I'm just like a more code question. Um, so if I want to make my own note and have extra libraries, um, how would I go about that? Like, um, I make new, uh, I make a new note, uh, so it's inheriting from note or whatever. But like, uh, the extra libraries are in the separate folder that's you there, mm -hmm. and just like. Um, yeah, mesh the code I want in there and compile it, and that would just uh, would it automatically go in the editor, or do I have to change another file to also show it in the editor? Just wondering about really noob stuff like that. Uh, no, in general, you just make a model. Uh, you have this uh, the model folder, and you can uh, put one of your own. You can put like a library inside, or you can change uh, compile options in there. Okay. Uh, you have like a file. Let me show you an existing one how how it works. So sure. so one note with all the extras is really contained in a module, or you can show the. Inet module to see how, how it works. A third party library is linked. Here's the, the modules. Uh, pretty much everything you, you want to, to, to add, like external library, everything, even your C code goes in here. Uh, for example, uh, let me check one that makes a node. I think uh, read map uses a node. Uh, it doesn't have a library, but. Uh, Inet. Sorry, I have a lot of problems because the, the mouse wheel is inverted here, so it's scrolling is difficult. <laughs> Uh, in it, okay. Uh, you have this configuration, which uh, in here it's pretty simple. It's Python. Uh, you can tell if the model can buy, can build, uh, and you can configure the environment. Like uh, this one doesn't add any flag for compilation. I think a few others do. Uh, you can add your own build flags here uh, in the environment, uh, and you can tell if it builds. Uh, with the SSUB, you can like add the files. For, for building, uh, and uh, if you're going to distribute a single model with a library, you can put the library in here. Uh, for what is uh, uh, built into the engine, we put the libraries in here. Like here is the init library, like by itself. And uh, but if you're going to distribute a model with a library, uh, just you can just uh, use this folder because the user can like. It clone into the models folder, and you can just compile and use it. Uh, and then you have the register types. Uh, this this function, like just write rege register the name of the model here, and types. This will, it doesn't conflict with other libraries. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this is the the class. You just use class db register class, uh, and the name of the the object that you made. And that, that's pretty much it. Just these two functions, you can uh, initialize the node, and, and that's it. And then you write your code in, in everything, er, everywhere where you want. And this is like usually as, a, as just a model. Um, yeah, I guess that's, uh, that's it. Hi, I'm uh, Emmanuel. I'm uh, on GitHub. I'm uh, Spoon, and uh, I'm working on the Python port uh, for Godot, so as a programming language, a scripting language. And uh, so I saw that uh, in the 3.0 branches, the API is going to switch from getter setter to more property-like stuff. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm wondering if uh, is uh, if it's just um, a change in the um, in the API, so just something uh, in the classes, or it's more deep change like in the implementation of the property. 
No, I think I don't remember because Python for properties, I, I totally forgot about that. I think you usually don't use them, right? In Python. Uh, it's just, uh, it's not a Python related uh, question, it's just like, uh, okay, uh, before when I was using GDScript, I would do, uh, for example, my object dot get rotation, and now I will just do yeah. my object dot rotation. The, the functions that use the property size are still, there. Them. Uh, in fact, in GDScript, you can still use your functions, they are still there. The properties were already there. Uh, but they were not accessible to script because they were meant for serializing to disk and for the editor. Uh, they were never meant for scripting uh, because you had the functions. But since people complain that they prefer properties a lot, uh, I think uh, it's probably that, that we just changed the names so, so they could be exposed to script. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not really a big change uh, from the code standpoint. They are just available now. Uh, they were they were always were there but not uh, exposed. So uh, I don't think it should change much for you. Uh, you still have the old functions and everything else. Okay, so if I already have the property support uh, in my binding, everything is fine. Yeah, you you can even ignore the properties and use the functions, and you can still use the whole engine. Okay. So I think we're all set with our ask me anything. <laughs> and it was great uh, to have some insights from you about the code and the new developments. So thanks a lot for waking up early. And Thank you everyone for gathering there. Yeah. It was, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>